And again, thanks to our two musicians. And welcome back from the lunch break. I hope you had a good lunch. You had inspiring conversations. You connected to new people. As we mentioned many times today already, that is what NEOS and the NEOS community is about. And this is why we, have, we are so grateful to have this event again here so that you can interact with each other in person, get to know each other, get to know other community members. We are now looking forward to our next talk here on the center stage. And we are very happy. She didn't have to come very far. <laughs> we talked with our next speaker, and she said she had a five-minute bike ride. So Berlin seems to be a very convenient location for economic travel. And she has a lot of experience with conferences, organizing them herself. She said she the talk she's going to hold today, uh, she has some experience with that. So we are looking forward to you submitting your questions via the app so that we can relay them afterwards. And what's left to say? Welcome on stage, the first woman for today, Karina. Yeah, hello and welcome. It's nice to be here. Um, I think having musicians in front at, at stage was the first for me, definitely. Gave a lot of talks, but I've never seen that. So that's a great start. Um, yeah, today I'm going to talk about um, what could possibly go wrong when you don't care so much about software engineering or you don't know about software engineering in um, space. And the answer is already on the slides, is disintegrating rockets. Um, yeah, but before I start, um, I want to give you a bit info about me. So, Karina, yes, uh, I work for the German Aerospace Center, um, DLR. Uh, I'm their head of a research group for sustainable software engineering, as well as um, vice uh, deputy of a department for intelligent and distributed systems. And the first question I would have for you is, who knows what DLR is? Hands up. OK, about a third. Um, but for the rest, I want to give a really short uh, and brief introduction. So first, the numbers. Uh, most people don't know we are quite huge. We are about 10,000 employees. We are distributed on 55 institutes and facilities all over Germany. And uh, we are on 35 locations and offices. One of this is uh, here in Berlin. But the big ones are Cologne, uh, Oberpfaffenhofen, which is close to Munich, and uh, Brunswick. And the name, especially in German, says already Deutsches Forschungszentrum für Luft und Raumfahrt. So it means uh, we deal with space. So it's about um, managing everything space-related, which obviously includes rockets and um, satellites, but also satellite data. Um, like here, we see a satellite picture of Burning Man. And what the name also says is that we deal with everything um, aerospace-related, meaning we have our own planes uh, to do research with special instruments and so on. But we also design like completely new concept for flight. So this could be a plane of the future. But there's also other topics we deal with, which is, for example, um, energy. So especially um, sustainable energy, like solar farms, but also transportation in the steel of uh, in the kind of um, next generation trains. How could the next trains look like? And also safe driving cars, while ours don't look perhaps as nice as some others. <laughs> but uh, hey, we do this too. So, um, <clears throat> so much about DLR. So it's a big field of research, which we already cover with my institute. But obviously, in research, you have all different types of research uh, fields. So this is just some examples. And through all of research, um, there's one thing, and this is that Nearly everywhere, software is developed. 
um, from small analysis scripts to analyze data um, to big simulation data. And so it comes that nearly everybody in research has to write code. But most of them are not software developers. And you might be able to imagine what this can result like. Um, but this doesn't mean we don't write big and great code or these people. Um, I brought some examples, like there's workflow tools who run distributed software and simulations on different type of machines on different locations. So you can design planes or satellites. We have simulation codes, uh, codes for airflow, um, for planes, where for, for um, yeah, uh, rocket engines or traffic simulations. That's all which DLR develops, as well as code for robots um, who can help as assistants here on Earth or in space, um, simulations of planets. Um, but what we are best known for in DLR is obviously software for satellites and spaceships and stuff like that. So <clears throat> we write big codes, um, despite not being software developers. And in the history, in the beginning, this wasn't such a big problem, and even in the beginning of space travel, because at the beginning, we had small machines. We didn't have a lot of computational power, so the hardware was a problem, but not so much the software. But then we got more and more capable hardware, and so there were more possibilities to do things with software. And that's the same in research. Um, we started with small problems which we solved with software, and now we have these big kind of problems. And now suddenly, not that it's only the research problem, but also the problem of how to write the software in a good way. And this is, was already stated in 1972 by Dijkstra, and it's tool for today, I think. <laughs> and the solution which they came up with uh, was software engineering. Um, the key was termed at a um, NATO meetup thing in Garmisch-Partenkirchen in 1968. So that's older than I am, quite a bit. And um, the idea was that we need a engineering-like approach to develop software. So this was started back then. And I want to give a little bit of an overview about this history, how this started, and yeah, how this looked with software engineering and space, or the subtitle of my talk, Disintegrating Rockets. So in the following, I will give a small examples from the history of yeah, space travel and what went wrong because which mistakes were made in the software, and how this could be solved with proper software engineering, which perhaps wasn't even known back then, So because then this was kind of brand new techniques or not really things we really thought about. And so we start in 1962 with uh, Marina One. Um, until then, when we think about software engineering was keyed like in 68 and in 70, I think the waterfall software development was really mentioned somewhere. So um, we are really in the beginning of more structured software development. Uh, we started this rocket, which should do a flyby by Venus. And it all started kind of with a hardware problem. Um, the antenna didn't work really well for receiving comments. So the autopilot took over um, because they lost connection to ground control. But the autopilot had a mistake. There was a formula, and they transferred something wrong into the code from the specification. And the result was that um, the um, rocket did a sharp turn. <laughs> which didn't really work very well, so it disintegrated. And uh, yeah, so it never went close to Venus. And obviously the assumption today was that if you had a unit test to check for that, this would, wouldn't have happened. 
So today we build unit tests when we use formulas, obviously, um, if they do the right calculations. But back then, this was not so easy um, possible. Then the calculations were done by hand. It was taken to the specification. Yeah, nobody really checked if it was transferred directly, correctly. Um, the next example, some years later, 88. Uh, Phobos 1, a research probe, which should go to Mars, Phobos and Deimos. Um, the last two are moons of Mars to research them, to get, collect information. And here everything looked really nice at the beginning. Uh, Phobos was flying, but after two months, suddenly there was no data received anymore. And everybody was like, okay, what's, what, what went wrong? And they checked, nothing really happened. But a few days before, a technician um, executed a command, but he forgot a minus somewhere. And this resulted in the command not being probably executed, but test code being executed. And this test sequence um, yeah, was just in there to run when it was on the floor, on the ground, not when it was in space. And it resulted in... Um, yeah, it's losing its right um, direction or orientation towards the sun. So it didn't get any more energy, so the battery just turned out. <laughs> and because they just realized that when the battery was already empty, they had no chance to fix it, and so Phobos was lost in space. Um, again, there was even a process uh, to check so normally, they should run um, the comments they would run on the satellite before through a system, which would test if it worked correctly, but the system didn't work correctly at that moment, so he didn't do it and just sent it anyway. Um, <laughs> so while they tried to introduce it, you see software processes are important, uh, that you follow them, or you can, it can happen that, okay, so, I mean, a lot of people perhaps can relate, like, oh, I do this just live in production. That's kind of what happened then, when you do this in space. Um, <clears throat> the next one is a bit famous. Uh, it was the first flight of Ariane 5, which was a quite common and big rocket, which was used for quite a time by NASA and ESA. And on the maiden flight, um, something went wrong. They were smarter back then, and they thought, okay, we know when we have something which is working good, we are reusing it, because it already ran several times. So uh, they used the inertial reference platform, which is a navigation aid, uh, they used on the Ariane 4. So they said, okay, we'll use it on Ariane 5, because it worked really like a charm on Ariane 4, so what's the best test like? It ran in production for quite a time really well. So they took it in and were really confident that this is a good idea. Sneak peek, it wasn't. Um, the problem is Ariana 5 was a much bigger rocket with much more horsepower, so <laughs> much more energy behind it. And it accelerated faster. And the result was that this acceleration calculations and stuff, these numbers got higher and we got a buffer overflow. <laughs> so um, what happened is the computer can't crash because it got a buffer overflow, and somebody was really thinking, OK, when something happens, we give out diagnostics so somebody can check what's going on. So this system, this navigation aid, did just that. It give, gave out some um, diagnostic data. The problem was that the autopilot didn't knew that it might get diagnostic data or something. It thought, oh, still data, great, I'm still using that. Um, <clears throat> so he used this diagnostic data and thought, still used it as position and acceleration data, which he expected, meaning, um, again, <laughs> um, Ariana went uh, somewhere else and supposed, and yeah, it was like, um, they had to decide what happened, what to do now, and it was okay, like, with six seconds left, and uh, they couldn't do anything anymore, they had to press um, the button to disintegrate it, which is a nice uh, term which space people use for, we let it explode. Um, this scheduled um, unplanned uh, disassembly, 
which is uh, if you press a button and there's unscheduled disintegration, that's what uh, when you don't press a button and it explodes by itself. So just for the terms. So um, yeah, it um, exploded. It was really nice fireworks and. Um, until today, it's uh, seen as one of the most expensive software errors in history. Um, yeah, today perhaps the amount, the number is bigger, but the value back then, 1996, was higher than most stuff which went bad today. Um, 1998, we come closer. Uh, we had the Mars Climate Orbiter. Um, it's Oh, sorry, I forgot something. Um, obviously, this could have been solved with a simple integration test, like running the system in combination with the other systems, with the output you expect, with all the different so ranges of the output, and uh, this would have helped. But yeah, too late. They didn't do it. Um, because this was such a big PR thing, and um, people really started investigating what went wrong, and later, they built this integration test to figure out would have helped. And the answer is yes. <laughs> they built this test, and it said exactly, rocket will explode. Um, oh, we'll shift this. So um, that was the first really static analysis of code where they went in and uh, tried to figure out what's going on. And uh, this had such a big impact that afterwards, politics and the public um, really went into this approach, okay, we need to take care more about big software projects, especially like space-related. And this kind of triggered a whole um, yeah, movement uh, that we got money and funding and security and safety, that these are important topics and that software projects need time and money for testing and all of this. So this was kind of a trigger event uh, which moved quite something in the software world, but also in politics and the public opinion about software. So, in the end, one of the most expensive, but also a really important uh, thing which happened in a way. So now to Mars Climate Orbiter. Um, here, it's another type of mistake which happened. So, um, you have to know that these orbiters are not built like by one company or one organization. Um, often there's different companies involved who build different parts of it because they're really complicated and it's a lot of things to do. So um, the ground software for the Mars Climate Orbiter, they um, used and sent uh, their data in LBF, which is, um, I forgot how it's called, um, one. One, sorry, I, don't, I forgot how it's called. Um, the course calculation software, which is talking to the ground software, they expected Newton. So it was in the wrong, um, oh, my English. Unit. unit, yeah, I said unit test so often, and yeah, still. Um, so it was the wrong unit, thanks, and LBF is pound force, now I have it, thanks. Um, so, it used and sent pound force instead of Newton, which is incorrect by the factor of 4.45, so quite a bit. And so, we got a wrong course, and um, the result was that the climate, he, as a he orbiter, he should orbit it in about 262 kilometers around uh, Mars. But the result was that it was just about 57 kilometers, and that's definitely a big gap. And the problem was, so in the end, we don't really know what happened with it. <laughs> um, it was lost contact, and there's two possibilities. Either it kind of bounced off, or it crashed and burned up. So we don't know until today. Um, Perhaps one day we figure out what happened with it, but that's the two possibilities we have. And uh, yeah, the interesting thing is um, there was two engineers who 
realize something is wrong there, there's different values and so, and they tried to warn that. And they even had a process, so they filled out a form like there's something wrong and you have to check that and please. But they filled out the form wrong and so nobody cared about it because they did it wrong. <laughs> so um, process is great, but perhaps don't be too strict on your forms. Um, but in space, it's really a lot of standards, a lot of uh, which you have to fulfill. It's a lot about documentation. And uh, so they tried really hard, but still something went wrong. And yeah, we lost Mars Climate Orbiter. Um, the Mars Polar Lander, it was like a combina combined um, mission running both of those. Um, also, like, didn't really arrive where it should. Um, the problem here was that um, the flight software um, mistook some vibrations while it landed. Um, so there was turbulence because, yeah, obviously weather on Mars, yeah, there's still weather. Um, it vibrated. And so somewhere the flight software must took um, this turbulence that um, as, uh, as, 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 as evidence that it already landed. So he thought, OK, I'm already landed. I'm shutting off my engines. And it was like 40 meters above Mars. So yeah, um, there is a nice hole somewhere on Mars, which is the result from the Mars Polar Lander. It landed, yes, right? It landed, so ha, ah, success. And to be honest, um, NASA and ESA and so, they always define success as like the minimum of result you can have. That's why so often it was planned that like Mars rover runs for like three months or something and then it runs for 10 years. This can happen, but that's because they always define success as a minimum. So it might be that people say this is even a small success because we landed. You have the right mentality, you could work for NASA. <laughs> Um, again, this was known that this could cause vibrations, um, but again, it kind of didn't reach the right people, and so again, this wasn't fixed. Um, yeah, processes are hard. And um, testing for all of this is still complicated because uh, when you go to space, when you go to Mars, you don't really know what to expect, so wrong assumption like this can happen. They figured out there might be vibrations, but they didn't really figure out that this could result in them and thinking it's already on the ground. The next one, again, going to Mars, it's like a theme we had in the last years. Um, 2016, that's not so long ago. Some might um, perhaps remember that. It was also quite a big in the news, or at least the news I read. And um, <clears throat> I like this story a lot um, because, again, it shows that there's unexpected things. Uh, what I don't like about this, this story is the name of um, this probe because I never know until today how to pronounce it properly. Um, so I always say Schiaparelli as fast as possible. Um, <clears throat> so the idea was um, this time they say, OK, we land on Mars. We know there's weather. We know there's storm season even. Great. We'll research that. We'll land during dust storm season. Um, so we can analyze it when we go down and not just like look at rocks and something like that. So because it's expensive going to, to space, going to Mars, it's a lot of effort. So you try to combine research interest. And um, <clears throat> yeah, so what happened is suddenly there was so it's, it's quite normal that it's in the last minutes you don't have any contact because um, Something is in the wrong position, and because of yeah turbulence and all the stuff, so that's normal that you don't have it. And um, here it was that the yeah way like Earth and the, the, the probes which we have orbiting around Mars and stuff were in a way that we couldn't really see what was happening during the landing time. Um, the only observation was a really simple radio telescope in India, where you just see just the line, and then it stops. <laughs> Everybody was like, oh god, what went wrong? So everybody was guessing um, what happened, and we had to wait until there was an image from another pr uh, probe. And the image showed that. On the left, you see before and after. There's these small dots. And um, 
One is a parachute and the heat shield, one is a, and the lower shield, and the other one is a top shield, and it's like on this, I, I highlighted a bit on the right. So that's the things which popped up. So we knew then, okay, something went wrong. We created a crater, and we left some other stuff there, but obviously something went wrong. And here the story was, it started swimming. And um, so obviously, okay, you go down during dust storm season, so obviously there might be turbulence. So it went from the left to the right, from the left to the right, and went higher and higher, like on a swing. And suddenly it went over the 90 degree here, and a value went negative. And so, <clears throat> again, it thought, ah, I'm not, I forgot the exact number, this is as many kilometers above Mars, I'm below. <laughs> That's not right. I need to stop everything which is stopping me, meaning um, the rockets which should slow the discan went just instead of 30 seconds after three seconds were shut down. The parachute was cut off and everything. And yeah, it made boof. <laughs> so again, a crater. Um, the story again, obviously everybody was like, why didn't you test for that? I mean, it's 2016, we know about integration tests, unit testing, everything. But the answer is, nobody thought that it would swing so high and that it would be a negative value. And this negative value occurred for a, a part of a second. It wasn't even there for a long time. So afterwards they realized, okay, <laughs> we need a new type of testing. Is, um, is the next value making sense? I mean, if your result is, okay, I'm 40 kilometers above Mars, and the next, in a split, a split second, it says I'm below Mars, something might be wrong with this calculation. <laughs> so new kind of testing are still developed, and perhaps you know this, like giving different values and seeing what's going on, and perhaps writing your code safe against unexpected values, and um, about the consistency of the values you get. Is this plausible? What's the next value? And so stuff like this was also introduced after this. And um, so a lot of processes are developed. A lot of um, things happened. Then, um, <clears throat> but in the end, I mean, we had quite some processes abroad which have resulted in people not following processes and things. But sometimes you can't imagine how big the problem is, which is sitting in front of your computer. So, the so Soyuz uh, in 2017, she should bring satellites to space. And um, the plan was to start in Baikonur, but there were some issues and weather, so they transported it to um, Vostochny, um, which is about 6,500 kilometers far. So, yeah, it's like a bit. You would have to drive quite a bit. And um, <clears throat> so they started it from there because there are the possibilities where there are weather better, everything. Um, but they forgot one thing. In such a rocket, you tell it where it starts. They forgot to change that. <laughs> um, so what happened was it started, everything looked good for a short time, <laughs> and the upper stage could not really align where they should go, and the thrusters started firing in the wrong direction. Um, this was really easy to spot because it was towards Earth instead of going away. And um, here we didn't have to press a button, it burned up in atmosphere, and that was that. Um, yeah, so... In the end, you can have nice processes, but if the person in front of it forgets that we are now six and a half thousand kilometers in another space, another spot, yeah, <laughs> then the software is perhaps not at fault. So, yeah, that's a shirt I love. Hell yeah, it's rocket science, exactly. Um, there will be future mistakes, there will be rockets disintegrating by hand or from themselves, because somebody made a mistake in their software. Um, because we don't know what to expect, neither of the situations which we approach on Mars or on other locations out there in space. And 
yeah, in the end, the problem which you always have when you software dev uh, develop software, you never know which great mistakes people can do who sit in front of it. And with that, I'm at the end of my talk. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed a little bit hearing about exploding rockets, and thanks for having me. Thank you very much, Karina. Very interesting <laughs> talk about exploding rockets and disintegrating. Yeah, right. <laughs> we already saw quite some questions come in. If you yes. still want to submit a question, please use the app. And let's start. Just before you start into the questions, <laughs> okay. um, I just remembered there is a German podcast. It's called Weltraum Wagner. <laughs> Do you know it? Yeah. And they have a, I think they also made a whole episode about software issues in, in space flight. So for all, everybody who's interested in, in more de even more details than Karina shared today, um, there's a podcast to, to listen to. Right, so we got lots of questions. Yeah, a few let's we can start share. with the first one. How do you handle multi-year missions as, as the knowledge of details gets lost over time? E.g., do you refactor later on when the mission is running? So um, <clears throat> there's, there's two things. Um, first, um, when you develop code for space, or if you do anything for space related, um, ESA and others, they developed standards which you have to fulfill. The ESC, CCS, um, ECSS, yeah, ECSS this way. Um, it's about documenting everything. It's so much documentation you can't imagine. If you think you document your code well, you've never done something for space. Um, so a lot of this happens there. And um, the second thing is um, we don't really refactor when we learn something new. We, a lot of stuff is written like in time. So for example, um, the mission where we landed on a comet was quite in the news and everything. The code for landing the probe on the comet was written after it already flew. Because it was clear it's traveling for 10 years. It doesn't make sense to write something before. <laughs> so you know, okay, we have this hardware, we have these constraints, but now we start writing the code, it's on the way, so you, you always write back when you have a deadline. So <laughs> you start using the time there because we know that there will be new methods, that there will be better code. And also, if you prepare everything in advance, you miss your, your start spot. So it's just too long. Um, so <clears throat> this happens, and this might means that people who wrote some of the part of the code or something from like starting it, and then 10 years later, they are already on a different project. And so if there are some issues, it's really hard to get these people back. And um, so it's on the one hand documentation, and on the second is getting these people back if you need them. Um, yeah, but that's like the main approaches, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh, look at those. They are coming in. Um, okay, do I need a what could possibly go wrong mindset to prevent disintegrating rockets? Yeah, so um, writing test cases and thinking and being creative about what's going wrong is like one of the major aspects people bring who, who write in those pieces. Um, and that's, that's not only about what could go wrong, but also if something goes wrong, how can we fix it? Um, People who work on that, like for the Mars rover or something, they get really, really creative to fix things in a way. Um, I always have these small stories, like um, there's a Mars rover and they had the problem that they didn't really knew where they are on Mars because they never planned to drive around so much. I mean, it was like 30 days or something and it, it drove for years. So now they didn't ha thought about how do we solve the problem that we don't know where we are because you don't have GPS on Mars. Um, so they got creative, how can we, they first tried image recognition, like, okay, can we see how much we moved or something, but Mars, there's not so much difference everywhere, it's like <laughs> sand and rocks, and the rocks are small, so um, it's hard to really define where you are, so they started to make their own notes by 
driving and then making <laughs> like small marks every so so meter. And so they figured out, okay, we are because they knew we are like on 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 the on a on an edge on a hill like a bit, and we're not going really straight. So they could let then with image calculation do something like that, like figure out where they are and how they moved. Um, so um, it's not about only go, what could possibly go wrong, but how could you fix something with that, what you have in place regarding software, getting on hardware, get regarding all these constraints. So yeah, this mindset's definitely helping. So here are some questions that go in the same direction. And um, how do you even know what went wrong after, you know, uh, it crashed <laughs> or disintegrated? Um, so for the first two things, it was assumption by me, like, okay, do unit test would help. Um, later, if something goes wrong, um, it's about learning from that. So um, if something goes wrong, or even if everything went right, everybody, there's a lot of analysis of what's happened. Um, so there's a lot of logs and output and everything, and everything is tried to analyze to figure out what exactly happened, which value did we had there, and so on. So it's about learning from your results, because um, while I mentioned, obviously, what went wrong, and it feels like a lot, there's also a lot of <laughs> missions going right. Um, but even, yeah, from the one who goes wrong, the mentality is, okay, we learn out of that. Um, so, for example, Schiaparelli was uh, the plan to have one of the first who, who collects like rocks. It's like a preparation stage for the next one, which should go down and bring stuff back or something from Mars the first time. But they still said, okay, we learned a lot because something went wrong. Again, mindset of people working in space. <laughs> so uh, we have a question. What programming languages are used most frequently? Is there like a standard which ones are allowed? Um, so I know obviously there's a lot of stuff done in C. Um, I know that there's different levels on which different programming languages are used. So it depends a little bit on where you are. So it's not like one language which is used. And it depends also on um, if it's like ground software where you have more access to it, if it's on a satellite or something, and even like on ISS or something, a lot of different parts in different programming languages. And a lot of things which are used there, which are really stable, are also quite old because yeah, it's running. So sometimes like reusing stuff is a good idea, not always it went went sideways. Um, so yeah, it's uh, C, but I also know that at least in DLR in total, we also develop in all languages you can imagine for all the different types of software. There's Fortran for calculations and optimizations calculations. Um, and uh, yeah, for everything which is more like on board or something, there might be even more modern programming languages running. So uh, do you have any re recommendation, difficult word, how to translate your experiences into our web development context? What should we be our main takeaways? Um, in the end, be happy that you're in the web development, where mostly if the website's not working, it's perhaps not as bad as exploding a rocket. Um, not as expensive most time and easier to fix. But in the end, it's about, um, on the one hand, using the tools we have today, like regarding software engineering, um, but also accepting that there will always be failures because something unexpected happened. Um, perhaps not with such nice fireworks. But um, yeah, and the important thing is to learn out of them. Okay. How much time do we still have? Do you have another nice question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, oh, yeah. If I cr scroll down. How do you deal with the complexity of the domain when communicating requirements from the scientists to the developers? Is every developer also a space expert? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> so in both directions. So. Um, the thing is, you have a lot of different domains and a lot of s different scientists working together. Um, so as I said, we don't have like this distribution between a distinction between developer and scientist as scientists writing code. Um, they learn more and more about developing software over time. They use more and more of this process. So it's kind of a duality. You also have some people who are more from the software side who learn then about the domain. 
Um, but for such big and complex projects, the most difficult part is to bring all the different pieces together because you have domain experts for the rocket engines, you have domain experts for ground control systems. So it's, um, I mean, I mentioned at the beginning that DLR is like uh, over 50 institutes, 55 institutes and facilities. And um, we deal with four topics mainly. So <laughs> there's like several who deal with all the different aspects of um, space related things. And so it's not only one institute who deals with satellites or something, it's a lot of them and they deal with different parts of it. So the t biggest difficulty is to define uh, interfaces really well. Um, to make specifications that everybody knows which parts are to be designed. But there's also tools like this uh, workflow tools, which I showed really, really quickly as an example of software from DLR, um, which we use to design software, but also satellites, for example. So people, and you can also use it for rockets. So the idea is that everybody has their specific domain where they are an expert, where they have their great tools, where they develop stuff, and, and before they decide, okay, what is the limits in which we move our uh, move? And then uh, everybody's taking their part, and it has to be put together. And this is why you need a very, very good specification at the beginning, where is the interfaces, how do they interact? And um, all of this sometimes on hardware, which is not really current because it has to be uh, stable enough to survive in space. So um, you can't send all the hardware which we use on Earth up there because of all the um, rays and so. Um, so it's in the end um, about defining specifications, about a lot of documentation and then um, also having people experience how to put all of this together. And it's a lot of management and organizational stuff, uh, which happens by ESA, who, for example, nearly say they do some software development themselves, but most stuff they send out. And they really, their main task is having the overview, uh, managing this, defining the specifications, checking that they are true, making rules and standards and so on, which have to be fulfilled. That exactly, at the end, this complex system comes together, and we see a rocket starting and hopefully not as great here. <laughs> then I think I have a good question to follow up. A mission costs millions if it goes wrong. Is there no risk analysis of what all goes wrong, no matter how improbable it is? Um, there's risk analysis. There's where people try to figure out what's happening, but in the end, um, it's research. And research costs money, and sometimes research burns or disintegrates money, you could say. Um, they always laugh about this. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so there goes a lot of planning into it, and there's a lot of analysis what could wrong, go wrong, but in the end, as I said, we don't know what we will sometimes face when we go to space. And um, we just have then to try. And I think this is why you need to have this mindset that I kind of made a little bit fun of, that we have these small successes um, and that you, you hold on to that because then without that it could get frustrating. Um, but this is why often they also overachieve in this project. So it's, um, they try to figure out what's the smallest thing we can do and everything on top, we are more happy about that. And so this analysis begins in the beginning, and that's why you define the small thing which you have as your task. And um, yeah, spending millions in research, that's kind of normal. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. I see some similarities of the errors that, that should never be thrown. <laughs> All right, Karina, very, very big thank you to you for your talk. <laughs> <laughs>